Good afternoon. This is State Representative Mark Batnick here here today for Policy Nuance with State Representative Mark Batnick. That's me. Uh, it's going to be the training wheels are coming off today, everybody. You know why that is, Deb? Why? Why is that? Uh, no, Scott Slocum. No. Uh, he well. has earned a very well-deserved uh, a, a time off. We, we hope he has a good... Good uh, day, skipping the show. So in studio, we have my chief of staff, Deb Carlitis, which is going to be very interesting. Hello, everyone. We uh, certainly (laughs) like to banter in the the office about all kinds of issues, and we are certainly going to, we're certainly going to do that today. Uh, You know, Monica DeSantis, I think, touched upon um, something that is, is, is very important to me. I, I th- was trying to think of a name every, every one of these episodes. I think this is episode five or six, Debbie, do you remember which one it is? I think it's, it's five, think episode it's five. five. Yes. Um, and we've always touched upon, uh, upon COVID. I thought the first episode was going to be COVID and then we would move on to some other issues, which we're doing no. that, but it, COVID's not leaving. COVID is here. COVID is, is, is <laughs> definitely here. And there seems to be, uh, um, not going away. uh, more updates and more involvement from me. In fact, I was sitting here dealing with some people and some issues, uh, right before we, we went live on the show that we're going to be talking about, mm-hmm. um, but let's start out. How do, how do people ask us questions on this show? Where do they go if they want to ask us some questions? All right. We need everyone to email us at IllinoisQuestions. It's with an S at gmail.com. So if you have any kind of questions for the show or representative, email us at IllinoisQuestions at gmail.com. That's the place to go. Or, of course, they could always just text you if they have your phone number. They could. <laughs> or they could go to our web, your website, too, RepBatnik.com. So Monica led off with... Um, issues at the uh, can't remember it was one of the Juliet schools that there's been more kids suspended this year and that people kids aren't um, doing well that there's been issues with the quarantine for the last uh, the last year and a half they're having trouble interacting with each other and I think kind of what's going to be my personal short term short to medium term unfortunately kind of the thing I'm carrying the flag for and have been working the last uh, last few days even extra fervently is keeping kids in school yes please um we've spoke about this so many times the the kids are really the ones that that are getting the shortest end of the of the stick here um obviously we know covid can affect anybody at any age i think one of the one of the uh statistics that we talked about in one of the earlier shows was a john hopkins study that said Mm -hmm. um the relatively small number of of kids who have passed found almost always a, a significant comor- comorbidity. Com- com- right. comorbidity. Right. It's always sad when, when you have somebody young that, that passes. But the flip side of that is you look at what's going on in whether it be Joliet, look at what's going on in the city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had kids who on school nights are, are shot and killed, and you wonder if school is open, if, if they would be alive. Right. Um, another thing that I've talked about was uh, just the, the income gap growing, right? So we mm-hmm. have we have some kids not going to school and you have middle class and upper upper class people who, you know, if their kids are struggling, they can afford tutoring. Maybe they can afford to go to a private school, which is state open. I, I, right. I think we've 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 talked to people in our office that have talked to us about uh, taking their kids out of, out of public schools when they're remote and right. switching to private schools. We've seen some, Absolutely. I think, waiting lists we've heard of at, mm-hmm. at some of the some of the private schools. So middle and upper income uh, families are able to do that where lower incomes are aren't and right. if you if you look at the scenario and these are calls i've gotten you know mm-hmm. the the single mom that has four kids running a restaurant that, right. that doesn't have the same opportunity to um, and can't homeschool and can't home, certainly and, and certainly can't homeschool and so what that does is that drives that income divide we all know about education and and, and the income gap and right. there's a huge difference in life expectancy um between the lowest and the highest uh, income groups, right? Mm-hmm. There's a ten to, I think it's a ten year for a woman, fifteen year uh, difference for a male between the lowest uh, income and the highest incomes in terms right. of life expectancy. So makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. A good school experience is important for the kids. When you look at the risk reward um, situation, it is incredibly, incredibly important to to keep kids in school. Um, and my focus right now, I mean, I, I've been, I, I've always advocated and thought it was was best to do everything we could to to keep the kids in school. But we're certainly we're a year and a half into this. Mm-hmm. We certainly need to uh, take it to a different level. And there's actually documents I got this morning, stuff I was working on last night. Mm-hmm. Um, 
tens of pages, if not hundreds of pages of stuff that I've partially skimmed that I'm going to go through. We're going to post on our website because this is all public documentation. New guidance just came out that I was emailed this morning that will be, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll post it on our Facebook page. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the Rep Batnick uh, website will get it up there too within, okay. the, within the next 24 hours. And, and uh, folks who, out there who are listening, when I say we, I'm looking at Deb and she's yes. writing notes down because I'm definitely going to get it up Because whose job is that? Am I going to put it on the website? No, I'm no. going to put it on the yeah, website. Yeah, you're going to put it on yeah, the website. Rep <laughs> so there's, um, uh, there's an important, important aspect about school that's important to get the kids there. Do you know what that is, Deb? The buses. I mean, you, what are we... This is crazy. What happened yesterday at, at 308? Yeah, you need to get the kids to school. Yes. <laughs> so uh, fill us in. I, I know I, I had talked to some people. Out in uh, 308 is Oswego, correct? Right, which and, is part of your district. Yeah, part of my district. So what was in here? I'm just reading it. 24 bus drivers and 15 monitors called off. So junior high and high school students, they had to go remote. So this was, uh, no one saw this coming, and then they had to deal with this. Yeah, and, and we're seeing... We're seeing big parts of the of, of the economy here where this is kind of a microcosm of what's happening with, let's say, uh, semiconductors, right? The, the microchips for, for the cars. When you have just right. one little thing, a breakdown, uh, yeah. one little breakdown, um, it throws the whole thing off. So you've seen... Uh, I know people that have, have bought new cars recently or new used cars recently. <laughs> That's me. That's her. And uh, prices are obviously higher than they than, than they used to be. Yeah, and you, you told me almost two, anywhere from one to two thousand dollars more for a used car. Oh yeah, I've I've seen things as high as forty percent forty percent higher. Oh, but if you yeah. drive by the if you drive by the uh, the lots, there's not a lot of a lot of new cars on the lot. So whether it be that, whether I've seen restaurants shutting, but. Mm-hmm. We kind of have a chicken and egg situation here with 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 the schools. Getting the kids in schools is also probably the start or a part of why we're having so many issues with other parts of the economy because so many people are choosing not to go to work because one maybe they're homeschooling, two maybe their kids are in and out of quarantine, um, so yeah, they which is happening a lot, right? So 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 they're uncomfortable. So. In order to get all this stuff is interconnected and keeping the kids in school, getting the kids to school and keeping there is an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important part of, of, of our, our entire economy. I think we're missing a lot of people from the workforce um, because of what's going on at school. So, But this here, I'm, I mean, I don't know the full story, but this said the absences were not related to COVID-19. And no one is saying exactly what was the message here that everyone called in sick. I'm curious what what was happening. Yeah, I think there's, a, a, um, I think in, in the police force, they would call that the blue flu. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some speculation. We have to be clear that we're speculating that the bus drivers were, were pushing back against maybe some of the mandates, mandates that, that, right. that, that were coming down. Um, but it's pretty scary that a small percentage of bus drivers not showing up right. um, can cause such a ruckus. So, in, in, in fact, what's happened with, with my family, I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, why don't you describe to the listeners the sporty vehicle I drive? <laughs> Your black minivan? Well, you can be more descriptive. The 2007. The 2007. 2007 black black well, it was still better than the minivan I just got rid of. So, yeah. That is true. Yeah, but it, uh, it's not, it, right, it's not, a, it's not a little sporty car. Yeah, 200. You're driving around in your minivan. 220,000 miles on it. Well, right. that, that has been transported into a school bus. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what we've had to do at our school district is um, we've actually had to coordinate with parents for Carpool. act, carpooling for extracurricular activity. So, yesterday, the, uh, the uh, black Honda odyssey school bus took uh transported six uh jfk junior high school uh volleyball girls to heritage grove for an exciting match Uh, for those who are into volleyball uh the eighth grade b volleyball team of jfk unfortunately had their two match streak come to a halt um, as they were beat by uh (laughs) uh beat by heritage uh heritage grove um annabelle batnick um you may know her. Oh, I do. She's yeah. my daughter. Who, who would that be? Um, she's a B, B volleyball player. Kind of one of the coolest things. Um, she actually she actually scored uh, in two consecutive games, scored 30 points in a row uh, wow. serving, which is I'd never seen that done before. Mm, um, she has kind of a, 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 a funky... Uh, Funky underhand serve. So I had to give that shout out to Annabelle. But the point is... Isn't it so nice that they are able to do sports? Yeah, though? but see, here's the point of that. 
the point of that is I'm from a middle class family. My daughter got that moment, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Yeah. Not every kid is able to have that moment now right. because of everything that's happening. Right. And I'm going to tell you something else that's right now. That is a moment that not only I but my daughter will remember, remember for the rest for us it was the B volleyball game right. it was 8th grade but to to put 30 points on 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 the board in a row is 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 pretty cool and that's something that's going to be uplifting for, for her Absolutely. and it, it's it, a character builder it's that's, it's a it's right. a character builder and it's 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 a confidence builder mm-hmm. um i'm 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 proud of her glad she ha- got to have that moment but there are parents out there that are struggling because mm-hmm. they weren't going to have i know that it, in fact I, I know from her specifically that there's been issues with with kids being able to stay on the team or make the team or make games so this bus driver thing is a big deal. So I'm, it is I, a big deal. And I think there's some, some big incentives at different school. Um, well, I just read an article, too, about a, a Plainfield mom that has a special needs child that has now a very long ride there, a very long ride home. And now she's not sure if she can you know, put her kid in her child into school because the, the ride is so long. Right. I think you mentioned so it, was, it, it was four, four years, as I believe. Four, the, four hours total. Four, I'm sorry. Not four it years. It felt like four years. Yeah, it felt like four <laughs> years for that for that child, I'm sure. But four um, hours. very, very long. So there's all kinds of things that are happening when we can't get our transportation and our, our workforce, I guess, healthy, meaning not, not well, health, COVID healthy, but I mean just up and working. So that's it. So that was a call to the office, you said, or you read about that? I read about that. You read about paper. that. Mm-hmm. So that is a mom that is that's taken from the workforce. So when that mom is taken from the workforce, some other part of our productivity isn't done. Right. And the whole thing is having a hard time being being rewarded. Wired. You know, I was certainly one of the people that thought once the um, once the unemployment extra bump bonuses rolled off that you'd see a bigger increase of of of, of people in the workforce. Right. And the states that rolled it off early, actually, the studies have shown the states that have rolled it off early didn't see that. Um, they didn't see. You well, why know, is it? It's because of the situations that you're talking about about right there. It's not so much that people don't want to return back to the workforce all the time um i'm sure there's i know that there's teachers there's some people that might have been at the end of their working life and some teachers and some other people are like you know what Mm -hmm. i'm close enough to retirement i'm done i'm 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 gonna call it in but if you look at a situation like that the the situation where the mom can't get her kid on a school bus to go to school for eight hours that's not solved by eliminating the unemployment benefits i it, it, it's it's going to be solved by something different else right. are are you aware what they did in massachusetts to solve this problem no they called up the national guard oh yes i do know that they called up the national guard in massachusetts yeah. actually um i did reach out to the uh to the administration on uh on uh calling up the national guard okay um, and what'd they say well the answer i got was that <laughs> what the, the governor <laughs> well wasn't the governor um we we don't uh he doesn't uh he'll occasionally listen to my conversations but we, he doesn't take me take me up for daily advice well, he but needs uh, to. Come on. um they didn't think that that was viable for the state of Illinois was was the was the answer that that I got. So I actually um, I brought it up a while back. I reached out a little bit more directly last night. Well, I, I guess it's just cause it's going to depend how bad it's going to get, right? Correct. And part of the issue is is part of the issue is when you when you call up the National Guard, those people that are in the National Guard, they have jobs too. Sure. So you're going to disrupt certain segments of right. of the economy as well. I think the flip side of that is is solving the bus driver issue and is part of solving the school issue. Solving the school issue, I think, is part of solving all of our issues. Keeping the kids in school and getting the kids in school and some regularity. And I'm going to talk about some stuff that I think is actually pretty good news. Um, keeping the kids in school and doing, doing all that, it's going to take a while, but you're going to see people, once they get comfortable with it, reenter the workforce. Yeah, so I agree. Pretty, uh, pretty excited. I agree. About Let's that. get our kids back in school, and hopefully, we can. I don't know. This is why. This is why we need people like you, Mark, because we. These, these are some tough things to get fixed. I mean, uh, really is. There, there's a lot, and I kind of want to get into um, the school thing and some specific examples about what uh, things that I've been working on literally the last couple of days and sitting in the parking lot and then Mm -hmm. sitting in the chair here waiting for waiting for the show to start um there's two people that i'm going to specifically specifically thank um i'm going to thank representative keith wheeler are you familiar with representative keith wheeler oh yes he's great representative keith wheeler is a republican out of oswego and um he's on a committee called jcar Mm. uh joint committee on administrative rules which is a very important committee did you know what jcar stood for 
Oh yes, I do know. That. Okay, all right, and then it's an imp- <laughs> tell me tell. Well, no, don't put me on the spot. Why you is tell it an everybody. important committee? Because they they decide important things. <laughs> they do. They do decide. Well, important. a lot. No, I. That's a tough committee to be on. What it is a say? tough committee to be on because you you a lot of well a lot of important decisions come out of there and, we, and and I'm sure everybody's heard of this committee but not knowing exactly the importance of it. So here's the importance of it. It it joint committee on administrative rules. It's one of the rare I'm on the audit commission which audits a lot of stuff. It's one of the rare committees that's a 50/50 bicameral um bipartisan committee. Mm-hmm. So oh boy, I think the count is four Republicans, four um, senators, two from the House, two from the Senate, uh, representing J. Carr. And what they do is, when we pass laws, the laws don't always come with very descriptive rules. The rulemaking authority is giving to the ex- given to the executive branch through law. So sometimes when the administrative branch um, makes decisions, makes rules, mm-hmm. J. Carr can overturn those. They can confirm them. Now, to be clear, while it is bipartisan, it takes, takes a supermajority. I think you need six of the eight members to, uh, um, and we're going to have Keith on one day. Mm-hmm. Um, he can get into it more, but um, it takes six of the eight, eight, eight members to overturn something that the executive branch has kind of done on their own. So we have, we've had a lot of issues with executive orders. J. Carr just kind of kind of sat out there's a, a couple things i think one through court and then one through jcar that came up where mm-hmm. they want to um they want to they want the administration to tell them where in law they've come up with some of the rules for schools right and this right? is just this is very recent yeah they, in, in in fact one of the things that yeah something with jcar i think happened a week ago right uh, the reason i'm giving keith a shout out is is jcar is one of those jcar is one of those committees that you sit on and you get calls from all over the state, and sometimes it's in the thousands, right? Depending on on, imagine, on, yeah. on on what what issue comes up. Right. So you're doing a lot of work, not so much for your district, for but for the state. I'm on audit commission. It's a it's similar. We do a lot of reviewing of you know bad audits of different agencies, and but I don't get the same sort of. I'll get some, but I don't get the same sort of um, overwhelming response that Keith does. And the reason I'm giving Keith a shout out is because because Keith actually reached out to one of my constituents that was having an issue with keeping their kid in school and with some of the some of the um, rules that. Um, actually got kind of changed as far as I could tell this morning um, from from the documents I saw. So um, he reached out to to this individual and the individual frankly had some good ideas that he was able to pass on to to the administration about how we could improve um, our safety protocols at school. So Right. A way to keep the kids in, in in school, but also being safe at the same time. So, Keith once again was doing his J car role was was helping me out. The other one is, uh, um, and I, you definitely know this person. You definitely know their their former chief of staff, maybe current chief of staff, um, the chief executive Jennifer Pertino. Yes. So there, the whole COVID thing is confusing. It and is. the rules and regulations can be confusing, and sometimes things can be interpreted in different ways. So the last. Oh, I don't know. I think since Friday, I've been working frantically on trying to get uh, some kids back in school. The way the quarantine... For the quarantine, right? For, for the quarantine. So the way right. the quarantine is set up, even if you're wearing a mask, if, if somebody deems you've been sitting by somebody that tests positive and you were closer than uh, three feet, I think is now the new rule, three to six feet, if you're within that little little bubble for more than 15 minutes, um, there's three three to four levels of quarantine, actually. First is you're out for 14 days, even if you have no symptoms, which I really don't think is viable. Um, I don't think so either. Um, we look at the the city of Chicago. We spoke about this. This is posted in one of my earlier website links. The city of Chicago had a charter school that closed for two weeks, the entire school, because there was 14 cases. That is not in the best interest of the kids, right? right? And that is beyond what the, the Illinois Department of Public Health is saying. So so kind of option A is that 14-day quarantine. Option B... 14-day quarantine because you were by someone by who, tested somebody po- positive who, who tested positive within a cert- right, within, for more than 50 okay. minutes. Option B is 10 days quarantine. You can't have any symptoms. Okay. Okay. So that's what a lot of the schools in the in the area have kind of kind of adopted. However, and this is where I I want to give uh I always want to call her Senator Bertino, but she's not Senator anymore. And Chief Executive okay. Bertino, that's a little little bit too long. I feel like just calling her Jennifer, but whatever. <laughs> um 
there's an option for to be back seven days after the exposure. To be back seven days after the exposure, you need to t- have a negative test on day six or later. And there's been some some confusion in terms of what the language of that means. What does that what, look like? What does that look like? What's required? There were there was some language that stated there on case by case basis. So what I've been working on and what's what's important to me is getting it at least down to the seven days, and um, and seven days I think is is unfortunate for the child. Well, and what happens during that seven days? Are they allowed to do e learning? Okay, so so, so they're at home learning, but it's the same thing. I mean, I've spoken to people that now have to take off of work. They're right. either using their sick days, and you, you see the ripple effect in the economy. And really, when you do that, you pay e-learning. more for your used car because kids aren't in school partially. Right. I mean, and really, you're e- paying more at a restaurant. You're seeing the long lines. You're doing all this stuff, right? And my son had a terrible time with e-learning. Right. Is, and so, I, so then you're just back a whole week, it seems like. Right. So so some, some, so some, some kids do well with e-learning. Um, I think particularly the older ones, I, the, my wife teaching special ed, pretty hard to uh, teach grade school special ed e-learning. Yeah. That was a very difficult uh, prospect for her. So in any event, you have, this, you have the seven days and sometimes the exposure might occur, you know, a day or two before you find out. So it could, but with the seven days and a weekend in there, it realistically it could end up being three, three to four school days which isn't great, isn't the end of the world. But something that came out came out today, and this is something that I'm, I'm perusing this morning. This is what you're going to post on the website when I send it to you and, okay. and, and when you go back to the office after that, is the new guidance. And there's a new test to stay uh, plan that they have where if you've been exposed, you test the first day. Okay. If you have no symptoms, okay. you get to stay. You test day three, five, no symptoms, you get to stay. You test... I'm sorry, day three, day one, three, five, and seven. I think they want to have four tests over that period before you stop testing. Um, And this would be for all, the whole state? As an option. Well, this is from the IDPH. Okay. Right? So this is from the document as I read it from the... uh, uh, the guidance from the Illinois because we Department have to have new Coast. options. This isn't working. Well, I was concerned, and we didn't get into Will County, and their new numbers might be might be posted at this point. But I was I was concerned that you were going to see more breakouts uh, with Delta when one school started in general, just because of the intermingling. Mm-hmm. But I think there is so much intermingling over the summer and going into it. Apparently, that hasn't been the case, or the test pro- or the protocols of of people wearing the mask or the social distancing or all the things that were the mitigations that we're doing are certainly working. Mm-hmm. I'm excited excited that we're to what today's the 22nd i think august 16th ish is was about when we went back to school right. right so we're a month into this and we've seen some 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 pretty good some pretty good covid numbers but yeah definitely i'm definitely excited about the fact that there's an option called test to stay and you know i watch it i i I almost watched no cable news um, when the pandemic started i found it was more um Help for me to read, not even just so much the articles, but the actual studies. When when you're seeing a news story, something's coming at you. You can't really pause it. You can't dig in. When you're reading something, and we're going to read some stuff today. When you're reading something, you have the ability to reread the paragraph several times to right. make sure it means what, what they say. Do. What it means. You always like I'm reading. I'm reading. I'm reading. Right. And then I like to look at when they're quoting a when they're when they're talking about a study. I like to find the actual study and read that. Right. Um, so. That's kind of been my uh, my mo, and I got to tell you, I think the uh, I think the test to stay technique is it if it, as long as this is all up to the county health department a little bit that they right. have to go along with what the state is recommending. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're able to move into that, I think it'll be better. Back to the cable news, CNBC is the one um, I like watching CNBC in the morning, see what's going on from an economy standpoint, and they seem to have pretty pretty nonpartisan, um, straight at you kind of coverage on everything and the idea of of pushing the that we're moving to the endemic stage that maybe it's testing 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 is a way to get more of the economy moving Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh you know we were hoping that it was just going to be utopia with the vaccines um obviously it hasn't been that but it hasn't been it hasn't been bad either and things are are going pretty well in in uh in will county um so I think testing is going to be huge and keeping the kids in school huge. So, Well, you also it, talked about the, you know, people having the antibodies last week, too. I mean, that is really something that still needs to be on the table, right? Yeah. So the one thing that I would say that, that so, and I've proved this, we're going to put it on the website. I want everybody to read it because I haven't mm-hmm. had, it literally came into my inbox this morning. Um, one of the things that I was 
a little bit disappointed in is, is the fact that we're not if you've been vaccinated or if you've had COVID within the last 90 days, you don't have to follow the same quarantine rules. We've mm-hmm. kind of had something like that for a while. But study after study, if you look at the Israeli study, which I talked about, um, and even what people said before the before the vaccine came out, the the exposure to the virus appears to be extremely durable. Um Testing is no big deal. If they offer the test to stay, I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. But if somebody has already had the virus, especially children, and if the studies are showing that previous infection shows more durability than the vaccine, they probably, in my opinion, should be treated by I, – I, I'll put it this way. I'd like to hear from an epidemiologist or a doctor as to why they're not treated the same way that the vaccinated uh, people are treated if, in fact, they're more likely to have more more durability. Right. They have the so, antibodies. But, yeah, pretty pretty excited about that that rule change. I'm actually looking here. We never really updated the, the Will County um, – the Will County region uh, in terms of their – their positive positivity today yet we've been doing it last week the region which includes us in kankakee is actually down to a 4.8 uh percent positivity rate um i want to say that was in the in the mid eights um you have will county is now it looks like they just updated our seven day rolling positivity rate just for the county is 4.4 um, we seem to get, I mentioned this before, we seem to get a little bit more of that Delta wave before Kankakee did. They seem to be mm-hmm. coming behind us a little bit. Um, we've been doing better than much of the state in terms of um, our ICU bed availability is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our vaccination rate in DuPage County and and uh, I know Mayor Cherico in Naperville posted something. Naperville is DuPage and Will. I think our vaccination rate in DuPage and Will is is, is strong. It's uh, one, some, of the, some of the strongest in the state. So um, when you look at kind of the dashboard data, uh, looks pretty good. I'm happy that the kids are mostly in school when they can get there. Um, I, so, do ha- I do have a couple of COVID questions coming in. Sure. So can I hop on here and you give can, you a couple you, you, of these? You can, you can hop on. All right. Uh, this is from, it looks like, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, but it says, what can people do if they are concerned about the safety of the COVID injection? What if they don't want to receive it due to, the, to their own concerns? Um, employers are imp- imposing mandated injections in order to remain employed. What are you doing, Representative Batnick, and what can you do to help protect medical freedom for your constituents? That's one question that just came in. Yeah, that's a lot. And I think I've hit this before. I mean, my understanding is, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this one, they're, they're still even at the schools with the with the administration. They require the testing, that we're mo- moving to the testing stage. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly not a, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm certainly a proponent of, of, of the vaccine, certainly a proponent of talking to your doctor. I certainly think it matters per age group. I've got a friend that has... Uh, You're not for mandated vaccines. So. D- d- not, not, not for mandating. That said, however, employers do get to do what they want to do. Right. And 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 that's one of the things that we've we've had people during this pandemic kind of talk on both sides that well the businesses should be able to do what they want to do. Well, if the businesses want to upgrade, if the businesses say, "Hey, I want my customers that come into my clothing store to wear a mask," they have that right, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's a private business; they have that right. And same thing from from an from an employee standpoint. I think where you're going to run into a bigger debate is going to be kind of public areas and more importantly when it comes down to kids and, and what the data is it, what the data is saying with kids um but uh i i, I certainly i look at the data and i think we're going to get into it a little bit more i think the case for taking the vaccine is strong um but there's a, different people have different medical reasons like i said the the Gillian Barr syndrome. Am I pronouncing that right? Somebody in the room, producer in the room, he can even talk if he wants. Hey, everybody look it up. It's GBS. I have a friend who got the flu shot actually, and he got, and what it does is I think he spent like a couple of weeks where like part of his body was paralyzed. Right. Um, it's a rare thing, but, but you, you but know, things, there are, there are rare things, but I, but, but I've seen some pretty nasty things happen from people who've gotten COVID obviously. So it's a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, you, you have to look at, it's, I kind of, you can, you can choose not to drive in a car because you think driving in a car is dangerous, but if you're having a heart attack, you might want to take that car to the hospital. Um, especially for, especially for adults, I, 
I strongly, strongly recommend the vaccine. But, but what go, about go the ahead. breakthrough cases? I mean, this is another discussion that well, we're having. Well, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we transfer into, and, and we may not be able to get to, uh, to, to the recall amendment section, but why don't we transfer into that, that you had a Fox uh, News article. I think it was the Houston outlet. Was it Fox, Fox News 26? Fox in? 26 in Houston, right? And yeah. this, this said, um, study illustrates how COVID-19 can spread among vaccinated, CDC says. So it says a new study of Texas prison inmates provides more evidence that the novel coronavirus can spread even in groups where most people are vaccinated, according to the Center for De- Disease Control and Prevention. A COVID-19 outbreak at a federal prison in July and August infected 172 male inmates in two prison housing units. About 80% of the inmates in the unit had been vaccinated. More than 90% of the unvaccinated inmates would be uh, would be being infected as well as 70 percent of the fully vaccinated prisoners okay so 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 right there there's certainly a difference between who tested positive so 90 percent almost everybody who was unvaccinated got it 70 percent who were vaccinated got it so probably not the numbers you want but but continue on because there's an important piece in there later Uh, on severe illness was common among the unvaccinated and this is one of the things you mentioned right yep saying that's that's what i want to get to Mm -hmm. the severe illness among the unvaccinated was common but what was the keep reading on there about i think there was a, some data about the hospitalizations let me see about the hospitalizations uh 64 percent i don't know i'm not i believe it was exactly I believe, where you are this is a long article yeah i think it was it, the hospitalizations were 10 to 1 so the unvaccinated 10 times more uh of the unvaccinated were um, hospitalized okay. than than the vaccinated. There's there's a, there's going to be a couple things missing in that article. First of all, um, one of the things that they've talked about with kids in general um, and people vaccinated or unvaccinated, there could be breakthrough cases happening. But because you've had the vaccine, you're asymptomatic. You have the cold. You have flu. You never would have thought that you actually had a breakthrough case. Hospitalization is really the key number, and then obviously serious times, cases. It, that's what it says. The hospitalization rate was almost ten times higher for them compared to those who got the shots. So, and this is the importance of this. This is one of those articles that could scare somebody or tell where you could. This is confirmation bias at its best, potentially. You can look at that article as a case not to get vaccinated, where I can look at that article as a case to get vaccinated. And maybe there's just truth to both, too, because people are having breakthroughs. Well, everybody, there, there's... Higher than maybe some people would guess. Right. There's, there, there, there's, there, there, there's certainly, there's certainly, both are true. However, if I don't, if, if my breakthrough case doesn't send me to the hospital and it sends right. everybody else to the hospital, the math on that to me tells me maybe I should probably go ahead and, and get the, and get the COVID shot. Here's the other part of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if this was the case in, um, uh, in where this was done or not, but I know in Illinois, they vaccinated people, um, in prisons first. Right. Right. So the other part of this equation is that if that. they if 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 the so like prisoners were vaccinated even before um, people under sixty five in, in in regular settings? Here's the issue: that means they're vac- they're more towards the end of their vaccine efficacy, right? The va- mm-hmm. If the vaccine does wear, but once again, even with it being far off from when they took the shot, they didn't go to the hospital by and large, right? You're talking about some pretty small numbers if it's ten to one, mm-hmm. and my guess is that if there's a breakout at a prison they're going to test everybody. So some of those quote unquote breakthrough cases, obviously they mentioned the severe ones were unvaccinated. The ones that went to the hospital 10 to one were unvaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, my guess is a bunch of those breakthrough cases, and it's a guess, a bunch of those breakthrough cases we, they wouldn't have even known about, but they did testing of everybody because of the fact that they had a breakout at a prison, right? right they were Whereas, if right. you got the vaccine and suddenly and suddenly got uh, and suddenly got sick, you're not going to. Um, let me rephrase it. If you took the vaccine and got the sniffles, you're probably not going to run out and get tested. In this case, they probably tested everybody. Mm-hmm. So, where that is, where where somebody would say, "Don't get vaccinated," I think that article is actually a case for older people. To get vaccinated if if you don't if you don't want to go to to the hospital, but here's this is actually something that I think is very good news, and it's about breakthrough cases. Okay, this was, and I already posted this on the uh, on the Facebook page um, for for this day's for this for for today's episode, and it was Oregon Health week, weekly summary, 
And I'm going to read this verbatim. Um, Overall, 5.1% of positive specimens in Oregon have been sequenced. Now, what that means is um, that means that of the 5.1% of the positive cases they got, they wanted to find out which variant it was. Okay. Okay. Delta is currently the dominant variant circulating in Oregon. At this time, vaccine breakthrough cases appear to reflect the variant circulating in the community. Additional information on variants can be found here. So they have a chart, and it's on page five of my link. And they have um, the alpha variant, 140 cases. The beta variant, 16 cases. The delta variant, 690 cases. The gamma variant, 47 cases. The epsilon variant, I hadn't heard much about that one. Uh, 38 cases and the IOTA variant, 29 cases. What is What does that glean for you? Does that glean anything for you? And it's a little bit of a hard question, so I'm, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, I realize, but... I'd rather hear what you're going to say because I know you have a good thought on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, it's, to me, what this is saying... The people who are having break, it's not that Delta is breaking through more because Delta is breaking through at the same proportion of people, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. Right. So one of the big fears about the uh, about getting the vaccine was that it doesn't work against the variant. To me, now this is one week, one study. It's the first time I've seen data. I'd love to see it in Illinois. Right. This is the first time I've seen data that breaks down each variant and the percentage of the of the breakthrough cases. So now there's more Delta breakthrough cases because there's more circulating in the community. Obviously, there's going to be more breakthrough cases. Sure. So what's the good news? The good news is the vaccine's probably working as it always has. You know, one of the things that you have to take out. Um, I hear people people talk about what's called statistical noise um, or, you know, correlation doesn't always equal causation. So Delta came on the scene months and months after people started getting getting their first shots. So are there more breakthrough cases because the, the vaccine is starting to to wane amongst people? And that's why they're, you know, and they're they're attributing that to Delta or is it just. It's, it's the same, and Delta just happens to be the dominant one right now. I'm not saying we know the answer to that question, right. but this is the first data point I've seen that kind of points to the fact that um, uh, maybe the breakthrough cases aren't tied so much to Delta like everybody was, was freaking out. Delta is definitely more contagious, but the fact that the breakthrough cases match the same percentage of the unvaccinated cases, I think, is is a really important point. Mm-hmm. Someone has just asked you, are you aware of the VAERS reporting? You want to give any comment on that and the data reports? Uh, too long to comment here. Yeah. I mean, I am, I am aware of the of, of the VAERS reporting. I think, I think a lot of that is, um, uh, obviously, a lot of that is, uh, is self-reported. And um, I think it's important. I think we can't, I think we have to be open and honest about um uh, I'm glad, let me put it to you this way. I'm glad we're being slow and diligent about how we're going to, I think the CDC is waiting, s- taking their time approving this for kids for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, things like myocarditis is the, is sure. the one thing that's reported and getting sure. those, do- those doses right. So I don't think we should, we should underreact. I don't think we should overreact. And I think we should take all data, um, all data seriously, seriously right. and, and, and look at it seriously. But um, I'm looking at the clock here. I rolled yeah. for a while. You, we haven't done our commercial break yet. No, we haven't. So we are sponsored uh, today. <laughs> can you can you tell us about our about our, our three sponsors that are are helping us? Yeah, the three sponsors just happen to be Representative Batnick. So this Saturday, if you have kids, we have our annual uh, Kids Safety Expo. This year it's going to be outside, so that'll be wonderful. We've got touch a truck. We've got 50 participants. We've got all kinds of activities and demonstrations. That's this Saturday, September 25th. Hopefully, if you're in the district, you should have gotten a, uh, an invite. 9.30 to 12.30 at Plainfield Central High School. Again, that's this Saturday, the Safety Expo. Uh, the next Saturday, Representative Batnick is doing a prescription drug drop-off. And this is always incredibly popular as well. Yeah, that is extremely it's amazing. popular. Um, so it's Saturday, October 9th. 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's at the Plainfield Police Department. Um, again, that is on our website. And then for the parents that are listening, and you have to go through that whole FAFSA financial aid 
incredible journey. Um, every year we have a workshop that really helps so much. This was kind of like, I love it when we have a, a people come in and tell us what we need to do for financial aid, but I want to have them show us what to do. So we have everybody bring their computers, all of their documentation. And yeah, we bring sit your computer. There. Yeah. yeah. Your and we sit docs. there and we make sure that you get your FAFSA build out. So it's amazing. So that is in October on the 26th. But again, all this is on our website. Um, those are three of our upcoming events. But hopefully I'll see some folks on Saturday with their kids. Yes. And I will definitely be at the kids fair. Yes. Uh, there was a prescription check event we did recently. I think I got called down to Springfield and, yeah, and, no, and, 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 and couldn't go. Right. And then the, the I don't think I've missed a, a FAFSA event. Um, no, and you've not missed a kids fair. So this I is going to be a kids, kids expo. Fair. So hopefully kids it's expo. Right. And yeah. it is all outside. We used, we used to do it just uh, inside and outside. Are we doing touch a truck this year? All touch a truck. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like there's maybe 30 touch a trucks. So 30 there's touch a lot. Trucks. And, I, I, it's, it's, and we've got the Reptile and Bug Show at 1130. <laughs> I tell you, the kids love them. I, I have held the <laughs> python. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I ever need to hold it again. I got that one picture. Shouldn't that count? We'll just <laughs> yeah. we'll just regurgitate that picture. Yeah. Every every kids fair act like I did it again. Yeah, um, the tarantula is what always gets me. I don't know. I'm okay with the tarantula. I, I don't want something that can swallow me. All right, uh, go to repbatnick.com because all of these are on there. I just want to make sure everybody knows it. So if you can come out, we would love to see you. Okay. Well, let's switch to. I, I know we have. Um, uh, we wanted to get to another article. We may not have time for that. Now I want to get some of the uh, some of the other questions that that we have in. Um, and well, the then, recall is a hot button. You want well, to the, the recall is a hot button, but I think you had some some questions from uh, uh, a couple of constituents. I did. Well, a lot a, of them. Are, well, quite a few of them are always about the governor. So <laughs> <laughs> this governor, he's just a hot topic. So um, it is, it is, it is the hot seat. It is. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, I, 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 they, I, they want to know if he genuinely cares about the people or is he, is he just political? And I mean, what do you think about the governor and does he have higher um, political higher, aspirations? Higher. And is he really going to, is he doing anything good or come on? What's up with this governor? Basically that's what every single one of them are saying. Yeah. <sighs> I think it's, um, I got to tell you, I will be, if we get this test to stay um, thing implemented, I will, it will be one of the most exciting um, moves that I've seen him make. Okay. Um, and I mean, in terms of caring, I think every, every person that runs for public office cares. They may care in their own way. They may care in a way that's different from what my ideological viewpoint might be or yours or somebody else. They're certainly, um, uh, there, there are certainly people that talked about, you know, I don't know, whether it be legalizing marijuana uh, that he trumpeted or, right. or or some of the some of the other uh, issues on the other side of the aisle that were pushed that he's, you know, he is. I'll put it to you this way. I like the fact that he, while I'm a conservative and I've said it on the radio before, he has openly said he wants to be the most progressive governor in the country, right? He, that he, he labels himself as, as, a, as a progressive. So I, I appreciate that. I don't feel like I'm getting snowed by him. Um, there's a ton of stuff that I disagree with him policy-wise. And there's been some things that we've been able to, uh, there's certainly been some things that we've been able to, able to work on, which kind of leads me back to, you know, something that, that came up before, whether it be, whether it be the governor or Keith Wheeler or chief executive uh, Bertino, you know, a lot of times people want politicians to be or their elected officials to like make headlines and and throw bombs and, uh, um, you know, really get everybody riled up, maybe file bills that really aren't workable but make the base happy or something like that and then there's and, and then there's people who want to be effective um i try to choose the effective route i've always tried to keep a uh, good relationship with almost everybody on either side of the aisle in it's terms true. of yeah. it, you know you can tell somebody yeah. that their idea <laughs> is crazy in your viewpoint without doing it in a you know uh, unnecessarily keep, mean way because you have to keep communication. Open. Well, I think it, 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 more, more importantly, there's been there's been times where I mean, our office has obviously had to work with um, uh, Bertino's office a lot. She was our mm -hmm. state senator, and we would have issues that would come up for 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 both of us. We we had that we overlap our constituents, our constituents over, overlapped. Right. In fact, you probably worked with Samantha as much or more than which was uh, Senator Bertino's chief of staff. You probably worked with her as much I or did, more than yeah. than uh, I even did with Jennifer. And there's just things like. The traffic light at 
Route 52 and County Line Road that they've probably talked about on on WJOL in in the morning show several times where there's been accident after accident. At some point, it's about governing. At some point, you need to be able to pick up the phone and have a good enough relationship with somebody like I think I do with 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 Bertino to say, hey, I kind of have this issue. How mm-hmm. can we help this out? How can we mind, mind map this? Right. Um, you know, we had a traffic light issue at uh, Route 59 and Champion Road on the north end of our district. Um, it's not always a traffic light, but it's, sometimes it's keeping schools open. So, mm-hmm. which uh, lead me, leads me to another story I didn't, I didn't get to. I talked, uh, talked about briefly. Um, when restaurants were closed... And we had those the, the new mitigations put in place. Yeah, um, Will I County, remember it well. Yes. Right, Will County started. Will County started doing really, really well. Our, we met all of our metrics. We hospitalizations were required to drop. I think six out of ten days in a row. Right. Your positivity rate needed to fall below six. Mm-hmm. Um, you had to have the twenty percent or better ICU rating and a couple of other things. Well, one of the things that happened was our, we were doing so well early, our hospitalizations fell and then leveled out. Yes, I remember this. Very so, well. Wait, yeah. so they what they did is with, with what the metrics did was mm-hmm. they looked at the metrics and said, okay, um, a flat day is considered an increased day, which you can't fall forever, right? In terms of COVID cases in the hospital, they can't they can't fall below zero. They're they're going to level off at some point. Some point. The reason I brought that up is. I was able to contact the administration. You sure did. Because I'm not a bomb thrower, and I try to work with people when we agree on things. I try to be cordial when we disagree, but they're going to know when I disagree. And I'm, right. as, as floor leader, it's my job on the floor. And, I, I, you know, you can look at my video on, on maps a couple of YouTube links ago. And specifically on policy, I'm always going to tell people what I think, where they're right or where they're wrong. But because of that relationship, I was able to talk to the administration and say, hey, a flat day should be considered a down day, not an up day. Mm-hmm. If things stay flat, we should be happy. The point of it was restaurants were allowed to be open in Region 2 two weeks earlier than they would have been they otherwise. Were. I remember that. You and, did a great job with that. Yeah. Y- you know, the people listening to this now know the story, but in the time, mm-hmm. to me, this this is the part of governing that's that's important. Now, there's people that are going to say restaurants have never should have been closed, and there's people that thought, you know, they should still be closed, right? You still have people at both ends of the spectrums. I want to say, too, that at that point, when you got that open two weeks earlier, that was a very critical time. I mean, they were just about, everybody literally was just about to close. So two weeks made a big difference. Yeah, two weeks, I think of two weekends for, for a restaurant. Yeah, it was very, And very I remember sitting in a restaurant by myself, having lunch, feeling pretty happy, mm-hmm. you know, that we were finally able to, uh, able to do it again. So, yeah. um, do I think, does he have aspirations for higher, higher office? That's been rumored. Uh, he's obviously trying to, he, he, with the energy pill that he passed and um, some of the other stuff that he's done, he has certainly made a name for himself in, in on the liberal side of the aisle and Democratic Governors Association and all that. So it's possible. Um, I think when I see some of the things like I, I did today about finding a way to keep kids in school permanently I, I i i do think that at least there's some that there's functioning serious governance happening mm-hmm. well so. since you just talked about you know his aspirations for political someone else asked are you going to be running again um and continue to represent hmm. the people and um also th- these happen they're also saying that they appreciate everything you're doing but do you believe that um elected officials should have term limits and i guess that's part of what we're we're talking about even with the governor you know yeah so i actually filed uh one part of that i can answer one part i can't so this is uh uh she debbie is my chief of staff this is kind of technically in the safe zone state time so we really can't talk we're not allowed to talk about campaign type things yes there's some some weirdness there and what you can and can't talk about so but that, term limits but but term limits i can talk about because mm-hmm. obviously this is this i'm going into i'm starting my eighth year i guess um but next year i'll be starting my eighth year been in a little bit over seven years how i feel about uh term limits is this um Self-imposed term limits, unfortunately, hurt the cause of term limits. And by that, what I mean is if somebody goes into office and say, I'm only going to stay there for I'm only going to stay there for for two years or six years or four years, there's a power of incumbency. So the so the people that believe in term limits get leave and the people that don't believe in term limits stay. Right. Because mm-hmm. they don't believe in them. So you never get you never get the critical mass that you need to get term limits enacted. So I um, I found a solution to that, I believe. Um, it is actually retroactive term limits. So what I came up with was um, 
the idea of 12-year term limits for uh, House, 12-year term limits for the Senate, um, eight years for anybody in the uh, uh, executive branch, the governor, lieutenant governor, all those things. But they would be retroactive, meaning I'm happy and I've signed the bill. So let's hypothetically say I am there for a long time. Let's I'm not going to be there 20 years, but let's say hypothetically I'm there 20 years. If this were to become law, I would I would be forced out, but everybody would be forced out at the same time. Right. And so it's kind of like one side can't get rid of all their nuclear weapons while the other side still has them, right? Correct. So if you're going to get term limits passed, you need to get that critical mass of a number of people in the legislature that believe them. And I think doing retroactive term limits where you would you would term limit people out once that passed out of their next term would be would be kind of the way to go. All right. Yeah, I think you had a few more questions there. All right, I know we're getting close to wrapping up here. Uh, you don't want to talk about recall. That's just well, you can. Bad. Yeah, I think you had a, a, a marijuana question since oh, we yeah. talked about it, and I can I can close with yeah. A, a people were asking what, what where does this where does the the money go the funds go from the uh, recreational marijuana and what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I remember when 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 that passed and budgeting's always been a, an interesting time. Is this heist in the country too? Or? Is what highest in the country? Our, our um, recreational marijuana revenue. Yeah, I doubt it. Oh, um, I doubt it. I think the number the is two to three hundred million. Is is the one hundred and seventy five million? One hundred and seventy five million. I think they're projecting Tax that to revenue, be high. Yeah. To to give you an idea, our budget is forty plus billion dollars. So it's. Um, a very small percentage, you know. So w- one of the pushes for for legalizing marijuana was, well, we're going to get all this revenue. I'm sorry, what I meant to say is, Illinois recreational cannabis tax rates are among the highest in the country. I know uh, I saw that. Tax That's rates are amongst tax, the highest in yes. the country. Um, <laughs> So a couple hundred million, and one of the issues with with the tax rates is is that if you if you tax it too much, you're still just going to have the black market that you already have, right? So in terms of if you're looking at it purely from an economic standpoint, there has to be that that kind of sweet spot. Two hundred million is a small small amount. The other part of it is is some of that two hundred million needed to go to um, anti drug campaigns for kids, right. um, social programs you know, a bunch of, a bunch of other things. So, uh, it really didn't do anything to solve our, our budget crisis. Most of that 200 million kind of, kind of went out the door to other places. So we've just got about a minute and a half left. So I'm going to turn it over to Deb to read again, our sponsors. Yes. Thank you representative for sponsoring this policy nuance. (laughs) Thanks for being on. <laughs> All right. So this Saturday, again, if you have kids, please come out to our Outside Kids Safety Expo. It is from 930 to 1230. That's this Saturday at Plainfield Central High School, right in the parking lot. All kinds of participants. Touch of trucks. And um, we have the Reptown Bug Show. All kinds of fun. I mean, this is just a fun day. Free, free, free for the kids. And, and they can want. yell at me there if they want. Right. And I'll they be there. To meet you. If yes. they don't want to email a question, they can come and tell me in yes. person. That's right. why I'm wrong. All right. Prescription drug uh, drop off is the next week. And then we have the FAFSA coming up too. All of this is on our website, which is repbatnick.com. So again, hope to see you on Saturday. So I think we have about a minute left. Um, we got some really cool stuff coming up on, on next show. If anybody hasn't really paid attention to the stuff that Paul Vallis is doing, um, he's really what I like to call an independent thinker. Uh, he's, 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 done some of the best jobs running uh, Chicago public schools years ago. Um, he, he was a, uh, he barely lost to Rod Blagojevich. I'm going to give him a hard time for this. He barely lost to Rod Blagojevich in the primary that Rod Blagojevich won. I think the state would probably have been in much better shape had he won that primary. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're hoping to have him on uh, next Wednesday. We're still working on that. Uh, we're going to talk about violence in schools and some other things. And then we'll take your questions. We're going to talk about redistricting. That's still in the news. Some Republican voter suppression and all your questions. So uh, we uh, we are it, happy to do the show. And I want to thank you. That's a wrap. And thank you so much for, for, <laughs> okay. for, for, for subbing in. Right, and enjoy the day, Scott. All right.